in this edition of Insight. 200 years of Fort Pier history come together in one room. Trace and Brian Beck race to the finish line for the fireball run. And First Lady Linda Dugart offers some great advice for young readers. That's tonight on Insight. Hey, thanks for watching and welcome to another week of Insight. It's been a busy week here in Pier and Fort Pier, and one of the big events was the Fort Pier Bicentennial. We had the opportunity to sit in a room with more than 200 years of history as dignitaries from just about every major family and the history of Fort Pier came together in one special event. Welcome to the Fort Pier Bicentennial Commemoration. I'm J.D. Vogt, I'm director of the South Dakota State Historical Society and your MC for tonight's program. Now if you're interested in history and you sitting here makes me think you might be interested in history, I encourage you to become a member of the State Historical Society. Our headquarters is at the South Dakota Cultural Heritage Center and we have a brochures available um, for your use at the South Dakota Heritage Store booth back there. Now it's been a busy first day of activities for the bicentennial of the city of Fort Pier and the weather really has not cooperated. But tonight, we want to mark the occasion of, with some history, storytelling, and recognition of people important in the history of Fort Pier and their descendants. Fort Pier is the oldest continuously settlement in South Dakota and this weekend we are commemorating its first 200 years. We received today um, a congressional record um, recognition. Um, Senator Rounds entered into the congressional record on Wednesday, November, September 13th, 2007, uh, in which he wished to recognize the history, culture, and community of Fort Pier as we celebrate its bicentennial anniversary. So it's really important that we commemorate um, our history. Thank you very much. I wanted to make sure I got that back to the mayor so I wasn't accused of stealing it or anything. <laughs> Human existence um, has been present on the Upper Great Plains for approximately 12,000 years. Before explorers, before trappers and traders, before settlers, American Indians populated this area. We know that early Mandan people lived along the Missouri River, later followed by the Arikara, and by the time the Declaration of Independence was being signed, the Lakota people had crossed what we now are going to know as South Dakota and reached the Black Hills. Lakota is one of three language dialects and represents several bands of people which are part of the seven council fires and later became known to us as the Sioux. Now as early as the 1700s, the French, the Spanish, and English were all laying claim to what we now call the Dakotas. Pierre La Verndre and his four sons were explorers of major note in Canadian and United States history. Although this Pierre was considered a failure as an explorer in his time, because he did not find what we now know doesn't exist, that Northwest Passage to the Pacific Ocean. The Lavendres did much to establish the French claim to the heartland of America. In 1742 and 1743, two of Pierre's sons, Francois and Louis Joseph, along with two voyageurs, placed a lead plate on a under a pile of rocks on a bluff overlooking the present day city of Fort Pierre claiming the region for France. This is the first physical evidence of non-Indians being present in South Dakota. The play claimed the region for King Louis XV of France. So Fort Pier was the first tourist destination in South Dakota. <laughs> and this is still 74 years before we call Fort Pier a settlement. Today, the Lavendre Monument is a National Historic Landmark and the plate is on display at the South Dakota Cultural Heritage Center. 
The next recorded visitors to the area were Lewis and Clark and their core of discovery, including Clark's slave, York, and Lewis's dog, Seaman. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark were charged by President Thomas Jefferson to lead a diplomatic, military, and scientific expedition across the newly acquired Louisiana Territory. When they reached the confluence of the Missouri and Bad Rivers, their leadership skills were tested as they met with the Lakota people. Lewis and Clark had heard about the Lakota and they understood that they were fierce people. The episode could be known as the great misunderstanding because Lewis and Clark were kind of stumbling. They, were un they didn't understand the situation in which they were entering. And for three tension-filled days, Lewis and Clark parlayed with Black Buffalo, the Partisan, and Buffalo Medicine, leaders of the Teton. Lewis and Clark want to assert it, wanted to assert the authority of the United States over the area, and the Lakota wanted to maintain control of the trade up and down the Missouri River. However, when tension was at its highest, and when weapons were drawn, it was Black Buffalo who returned calm to the situation. With us tonight, is a descendant of Meriwether Lewis and a descendant of Black Buffalo. Please rise and be recognized. The city of Fort Pierre points to the arrival of Joseph Lafremboise and the establishment of his trading post in 1817 as the origins of the city. What he probably built was a simple cabin, but he set in motion the continuous American settlement in the Fort Pier area. Within two years, a competing trading house was established nearby, and by 1822, the Columbia Fur Company built Fort Tecumseh, which supplanted Laframboise's operation and he moved out of the area. La Frambois married five successive daughters of an American Indian leader and later married Jane Dick Dixon. Descendants of Joseph La Frambois are with us tonight. Please stand and be recognized. Conditions were exceptional for the fur trade on the Northern Great Plains. Beaver and small animals, deer, and more importantly, bison, more commonly known as buffalo, were plentiful. Trade goods made it, made economic, it made it economically beneficial for the American Indians who occupied the Missouri River Valley to play a key role in the fur trade. It was Pierre Chateau Jr.'s experiment in bringing the steamboat Yellowstone to Port Tecumseh that, provide, that proved the feasibility of steamboat transportation in the upper Missouri River, replacing the much smaller keel boats and substantially changing the fur trade business. In 1832, the American Fur Company replaced Fort Tecumseh with Fort Pierre Chateau, named in honor of Pierre Chateau, Jr., the, name, the namesake of the modern cities of Fort Pierre and the capital city of Pierre. Fort Pierre Chateau was one of the most important fur trade forts in the American West. Known as Clade, Pierre Chateau Jr. was most, the most prominent figure in the fur trading West and the principal owner and operator of the American Fur Company. Not only was Pierre Chateau Fort Pierre Chateau, one of the largest and best equipped trading posts in the Northern Great Plains, but the trading activities epitomized the commercial alliance between American Indians and Americans. By the 1850s, the fur trade was waning and the buffalo herds were greatly reduced. The American U.S. Army purchased Fort Pierre Chateau in 1855, making it the first military post on the upper Missouri region. The military abandoned the fort and relocated to the new Fort Randall 
Today, no visible remains exist of the fort, but the site is a National Historic Landmark. The fort site, located up South Dakota Highway 1806, is owned by the South Dakota State Historical Society, and the Pier, Fort Pier Historic Preservation Commission is going to build a representational bastion or tower and add further historical information at the site in the near future. The original Fort Pierre Chateau is memorialized in the early artwork of both Carl Bodmer and George Cantlin, who traveled into this region in the 1830s. Again, more tourists. Descendants of Pierre Chateau Jr. are with us tonight. Please stand and be recognized. The journal and letter books of 1830 to 1860, Fort Tecumseh and Fort Pierre Chateau, is hot off the press. I mean, it arrived today, and it's available at the South Dakota Heritage Store booth. Just, <laughs> I'm working them in there, folks. <laughs> A Fort Pierre II was built in 1859 and operated as a fur trading post until 1863. And during this early time, much of the West was unceded Indian land. But the first Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 created the, West, the land west of the Missouri River as Indian territory. And the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 created the Great Sioux Reservation. Congressional actions in 1887 and 1898 established the Indian reservation system in South Dakota largely as we know it today, and opened West River officially to non-Indian settlement in 1890. Now the anticipated land boom did not take place except at Fort Pierre. That same year, Fort Pierre defeated the town of Stanley to be the county seat, and almost overnight, Fort Pier became a thriving town. At one time, it was estimated that 60 million buffalo roamed the Great Plains. And by 1890, it was estimated there was as few as 541 buffalo left in, left in North America. A French trapper turned rancher, Frederick Dupree, under the influence of his Lakota wife, good elk woman, decided to do something about the state of affairs. After participating in the last great buffalo hunt, he and his sons captured five buffalo calves and raised them on his ranch. Descendants of Frederick and good elk woman, Dupree are with us tonight. Please stand and be recognized. By the time of Frederick Dupree's death, the buffalo herd had grown more than tenfold, and Scottish-born Fort Pier rancher, James Scotty Phillip, was under the influence of his American Indian wife, Sarah Larrabee, bought the Dupree herd. Phillip, his ranch hands, and a couple of Dupree somehow managed to drive the buffalo to Phillip's ranch from near Fort Pier and secured them in a high fenced area. After Phillip's unexpected death in 1911, the once modest herd had now grown considerably to 1,000 head. And from that herd, 36 buffalo were sold to Custer State Park to start their herd. Scotty Phillip is known as the man who saved the buffalo. Today, the mascot of Stanley County Schools is a buffalo. A descendant of Scotty, James Scotty and Sarah Phillip is with us tonight. Please stand and be recognized. We're going to jump ahead in time to two more contemporary individuals. John Charles Waldron was born in Fort Pierre to a rancher, Charles Waldron, and Jane Van Mateer. He graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1924. 
and pursued a military career as an airman in the Navy, both as a pilot and instructor. He married Adelaide Wentworth. On the eve of the United States entry into World War II, Lieutenant Commander John C. Waldron took command of a newly formed Torpedo Squadron 8. Now the Battle of Midway is considered the turning point in the defeat of the Japanese during World War II. And Commander Waldron and his squadron were the first planes to approach the Japanese carriers. And all 15 planes were shot down. However, their attack forced the Japanese to change their strategy and altered the course of the battle in favor of the Allies. Lieutenant Commander Waldron received the Navy Cross posthumously. Among other naval namesakes, the John C. Waldron Bridge across the Missouri River between Pier and Fort Pier was renamed in his honor in 2002. A descendant of John C. Waldron is with us tonight. Please stand and be recognized. Cowboys tend to have a rowdy character, and Fort Pier has a Wild West reputation. So combine the two, and you have stories that make legends. Enter Casey Tibbs. Fort Pier's own American cowboy, rodeo performer, and actor. Casey loved Fort Pier and his family, and this was one party he would not have wanted to miss. Casey Tibbs started riding in rodeos as an early teen, teenager, 13 or 14, and just five years later, he became the youngest man to win, ever to win a national saddle bronc riding title. His father, John, did not approve of the rodeo, and when Casey entered the 4th of July rodeo in Fort Pier, his daddy told him not to bother to come home. And Casey didn't. His mother, Florence, provided the approvals for him to continue to compete in rodeos because he was underage. Casey supported himself by breaking horses for ranchers during his teen years. His father eventually watched him perform in a rodeo, and it began their reconciliation. Between 1949 and 1955, Tibbs won a total of six professional rodeo cowboy association bronking riding championships a record still unchallenged, plus two all-around cowboy championships and one bareback riding championship. Following his career, rodeo career, Tibbs wrote a syndicated column, performed as a stuntman, and starred in movies. I am confident we have Tibbs' descendants in the audience tonight. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Hey, we'd like to thank all the volunteers and everyone that helped make the Fort Pier Bicentennial such a major success. And remember, you can catch all the parades of the Bicentennial Ceremony and, of course, the Dignitary Reception right here on Oahe TV. Watch channels 608 and Cable 8 for exact broadcast times.